Okay, this is from Bob Bose or Bosey, B-O-W-S-E, Glenn and John. Can you each name a couple of authors, thought leaders, intellectuals, et cetera, who have been responsible for a significant change in the way you think about race, racism, or public policy? What were these novel ideas and what did they displace? Okay, so I can name, I'll name a few people. A very informative, uh, formative period for me was my years at Harvard in the 1980s when I was on the faculty, first of the economics department, then of the Kennedy School of Government. And there were a couple of people uh, whose impact on me really and whose originality of research really stands out. This is old school stuff. Now we're going back to the 80s. One of them was or Orlando Patterson, the sociologist, whose book, Slavery and Social Death, had a huge impact on me. It was published in 1982. And the other was Thomas Schelling, the economist, a Nobel honoree, and a good friend of mine until he passed away in 2016 whose book, Micro Motives and Macro Behaviors, had a big impact on me. I think it was published in, I'm going to say, 91 or 92. Patterson gave a theory, of, I won't go on for long. Patterson gave a theory of uh, what the essence of slavery was that has always uh, resonated with me, which is dishonor. He says, uh, slavery is the permanent, violent domination of natally alienated and generally dishonored persons. That's a quote of his definition. Natal alienation is that the connections of parents to their progeny is interrupted by the fact that the master can intercede because he has a property claim over the progeny. And general dishonor is a, a more subtle idea. It's the idea that you can't have standing in society. I mean, he points out that there, there were eunuch slaves back in the days of the of the Ottoman Empire, who were very powerful people, but they were of zero social standing. They they could never threaten to to become politically popular or anything like that, and and so were given a lot of sway. But they were still slaves. And he points out that until the reserve clause in professional sports, a player might be owned, his contract might be owned by a team, and he's not free to play his uh, talent anywhere he might like at any time because of the complicity amongst uh, the various uh, team owners to, to not hire and respect the contract. But that person is not a slave, just a Patterson. If you'll give me another moment, I'll just say about Schelling. Uh, he has this beautiful insight that a very small amount of preference to be around your own kind can lead to massive to segregation in the way in which people connect and locate. He invites you to think about a checkerboard with red and black squares and red and black checkers. And a neighborhood is nine squares. It's a checker and all those that touch on the checker. And he says, suppose you move. It's an unlimited board with no boundaries, so you can move. Suppose you move whenever you're in a neighborhood where you're not in the majority. All you want to do is be in the majority in your neighborhood. But there are nine constituents to a neighborhood, which means that one or the other group has to be in a minority since the closest split is five to four. So if you're in a mixed community, you're going to be in a minority. So the only stable outcome is people keep moving until they, there are no mixed communities anymore. And you accomplish complete segregation out of the supposition that people's only wanted to be in neighborhoods where they were not in the minority. They didn't necessarily want complete segregation, but that's what you get when they're free to move. And this is this appeals to an analytical social scientist because it's an anomalous implication of some very simple assumptions about behavior. The assumptions are compelling and the outcome is striking, but there's kind of a, a lesson in there about not wanting to get too uh, excited. I see a pattern, therefore I want to impute something to the individuals who produce that pattern, and that can be a mistake. That, that I thought was a deep insight. Those are two things. Um, I'll be briefer. Shelby Steele, yeah. the book that turned me was his The Content of Our Character, which showed me that I could be impatient with what we're told is the proper and enlightened way of being a Black person and not be broken or strange or wrong. Shelby nailed it in that book. That appeared be, in 1990, if I'm not 1990, mistaken. and for me it was, it was biblical. And then another one that has never gotten around as much, but that I know has its fans, is... By Fred Siegel, 
who taught at Cooper Union um, here in New York City and was a Manhattan Institute person, knew a lot of people I knew. I knew him. He he passed away yeah, last year. I knew year. him too. Yeah. And he did a book called um, The Future Once Happened Here. Kind of yeah. rambled, but he wrote about what happened with race in especially New York and Washington, D.C. from the 60s to yeah. the early 90s. And he told truths that I had never known. My whole rant about people being put on welfare and how transformative that is, the root of that, and a lot of people think I exaggerate about it. I've never been sure why, including you, Glenn, but I learned about that from Fred's book. He describes it well. He does a very good depiction of Marion Barry, what the essence of that mess was, not just that he was a colorful person, but you know why that happened, how DC got to that point. And that one really woke me up to the basic reality that what kind, smart people think is the unassailable truth about race in America very often isn't. Those two books were a lot of what made me one day write my book, Losing the Race. I'm looking at it right now, which kind of changed my life and is why you and I are talking here. But those two, and then now they're both old, but they're both still worth reading. The Future Once Happened Here by Fred Siegel and The Content of Our Character by Shelby Steele. Yeah, I know both of those books and I can affirm that they are uh, epic. Steele, especially, I think, because he introduced a way of thinking which has shaped his writing for the 35 years or so since he began the essays that issued in The Content of Our Character. He was publishing in Harper's, as I recall, in the 80s. Uh, on these things. I'm black, you're white, who's innocent? That was the title of of uh, his inaugural contribution in this vein. And yeah, the lament about how the engine of upward mobility, which was City College or City University, New York, or which were the pushcart merchants who became small storefronts who, that, that ended up becoming department stores and and whatnot, or whatever, the vitality of upward mobility in New York City running afoul of the post-1960s uh, liberal John Lindsay-esque sentiment about social policy, including welfare policy, and a lament that that had led to the unfortunate, less uh, successful uh, transition of the new minorities in New York City of Black and Latino. 